Policy Club. We're going to continue trying to answer the question today, is there oil in Israel in progress? That is under pressure, or it is crouched, or it is lurking, or it is embedded. And then there's another word, under. Now, let me read this together. Blessings of the deep that lieth under. Here's why we would say that. <laughs> We would say crude oil, okay? <laughs> That's what we would say. We just say crude oil, okay? But let's get to the more direct meaning. Blessings of the abyss under pressure that are embedded. God of thy Father going to bless you with rain, bless you with children, and bless you with something under pressure that squirts out of the ground from really, 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 really deep. Well, now, if we'd been there beside that deathbed, and if we'd have heard that, if we'd have understand exactly what that Hebrew was saying, we'd have still been scratching our heads because we'd had no idea that in about 3,500 years, crude oil would be under pressure deep in the earth and come squirting out to make nations great, not just companies, not just people, not just individual families, but oil makes a nation great. As a matter of fact, are you familiar with the story of Spindletop. Here's the story, <laughs> and I'm going to back up even before Spindletop. January 1st, 1901. I used to live in Topeka, Kansas. I know this story, and I know it well. I've been there to these places. Uh, many times I used to drive by them all the time. Here's the story. It was started out by a fellow by the name of Stone. He was going to build his castle, but he ran out of money. And as he ran out of money, the Bethel Bible College bought his castle, turned it into a Bible college. January 1, 1901, the students had been sent home. They'd been studying and reading about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And they'd been sent home with the question, what is the initial physical evidence of receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit? All 40 of them came back with the same answer, and that is, speaking in tongues. One of the girls said, well, in the Bible, it says that they laid hands on them to get this baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, would you lay hands on me? And the teacher said, I, I, I guess so. The girl stepped up, hand laid on her head, and boom, she broke into speaking in tongues and prophesying. The next person stepped up, the next person, the next person, all 40 of them got the baptism of the Holy Spirit right there and right then. Then a fellow by the name of, I believe it was uh, Charles Parnum, I think that's correct, black man, saw what was going on, took the experience to Azusa Street, and from there the Holy Spirit went all around the globe. Now, here's a very important point. That was January 1, 1901. January 10, nine days later, Spindletop was hit. Uh, here's the story on Spindletop. Basically, this guy Lucas had long believed that oil could be located underneath salt, massive amounts of oil. And this particular salt dome had had some oil leaks in the area, or oil seeps, where the oil is just kind of like the Beverly Hillbillies uh, seeping out of the ground, remember? Okay. And he got this rig, got some money, and began drilling. And yeah, I'm having to do this off the top of my head, but I believe it was like only uh, about 1,100 feet down. He hit a massive gusher. Took him nine days to stop it from gushing. It blew out over 200 feet in the air, some 80,000 barrels a day. Now, you have to understand, in those days, five barrels a day was real good. But when this thing came blowing in at 80,000 barrels a day, I mean, that was more oil than the rest of the world was pumping out at that time. All of a sudden, everybody and their brother had some kind of claim to it. And they moved all of these rigs down there just back to back to back to back, just next to each other. And 90 days later, 200 companies had moved in 100 rigs, and they were drilling like crazy, pumping all that oil out. And from that came companies like Mobil and Exxon and Gulf and those type companies. In other words, because America accepted the Holy Spirit, they got the blessings of crude oil. And I can show you another scripture. Matter of fact, since we're on the topic, I probably ought to go ahead and do that. Let me bring it up here. 
Psalm 81.14, really important, answers a big question. A lot of people are saying, well, how come they haven't found the big amounts of oil in Israel so far? Well, there's a physical answer. And there's a spiritual answer. The physical answer is, obviously, they drilled either in the wrong spot or they didn't drill deep enough or E, all of the above. (laughs) And I think it's E, all of the above. (laughs) Uh, In other words, they didn't drill in the right place and they didn't drill deep enough. However, there is a spiritual reason. And here's the spiritual reason. Again, because America accepted the Holy Ghost, they got the blessings of oil. However, it's exactly the opposite for Israel. Psalm 81:14. I should soon have subdued their enemies and turned my hand against their adversaries. The haters of the Lord should have submitted themselves unto him, but their time should have endured forever. He should have fed them also with the finest of the wheat, and here it is, here it is, listen to this, and with honey out of the rock should I satisfy thee. Now, we haven't talked about the honey out of the rock, but we're about to. I believe what that scripture is saying, that if they had turned to God, then he would have given them the milk and honey. And now we're up to the milk and honey. So let's talk about that. You remember the story, Exodus 3, 8. All of a sudden, this burning bush starts burning right in front of Moses. God speaks to him audibly. Take off your shoes. The land that you're standing on is holy ground. So he sees this bush burning, but it's not being consumed. Why? It's the glory of God. He's in the presence of the glory, the glowing fire. When Jesus returns and goes and blows his glory down on the earth, that's what he's going to be blowing. And it's a fire. The scriptures say it's a consuming fire. Now, so he's standing at this burning bush. God speaks to him audibly, tells him he's going to get him up. He's going to send him into another land, a good land, Exodus 3, 8, a large and a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, that's the way we interpret it today. However, when we go back into the Hebrew, the word milk is not exactly interpreted correctly there. Flowing with milk, the word is richness. It didn't really say milk. And then unhoney. And it didn't say honey. In other words, the exact translation is it's not flowing with milk and honey, but the exact translation would be flowing with richness and stickiness. Well, now, <laughs> try to imagine you're standing at the, uh, the, the burning bush and you're Moses. God says, get you up. I'm going to send you into land flowing with riches and stickiness. Well, <laughs> what is that? <laughs> you know, even if he'd have found it, even if he'd have found massive amounts of crude oil 3,000 years ago, it wouldn't have done him any good. There weren't any automobiles that needed it. There weren't houses that needed it. So, I mean, don't get me wrong, it was still a value, but nothing like it is today. All right, so he was promised richness and stickiness. The King James translates it as milk and honey. Now, I don't think King James totally got it wrong, and I'm going to show you why here in just a minute. Now, let's go on to where Moses is on his deathbed. Now, kind of like Isaac was on his deathbed. All right, now uh, Moses is on his deathbed. And the way he prophesies to the children of Israel, if you read the whole thing, what happened was this pillar would come into the tabernacle, this pillar of fire, this pillar of glory, okay? And God would speak to him out of this pillar. And basically, I think it was just kind of like a light beam just from heaven showing down and spoken to him right out of the light beam, okay? That's, that's what I kind of picture there. Deuteronomy 32.10. This coming, this song of Moses, this is directly from God. God gave it to Moses. Moses calls the people around and repeats what he just heard this pillar of fire say. Now, here's what he says. He found him, referring to Israel, in the desert land and in the waste howling wilderness. He led him about. He instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. Now, essentially, that if we were addressing a letter, that just says, Dear Israel. Okay, that's essentially what it's saying. Now, here it comes, the blessings for Israel. Verse 13. He made him to ride upon the high places of the earth, that he might eat the increase of the fields, and he made him to suck honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock. Well, what is the first thing talking about? What does it mean? He made him to ride upon the high places of the earth. 
Well, Israel doesn't have high mountains. And if she was like Switzerland, having high mountains, are having high mountains in your nation a big blessing? Does Switzerland get multitude millions of dollars from having high mountains in it? Uh, no, <laughs> uh, not exactly. <laughs> not at all. As a matter of fact, it's kind of a curse. OK, you can't plant on it. The only thing you can do is look up at the snow blowing on it. OK, so that's not what he's talking about. What's he talking about? Well, the answer is given over in Exodus 20, verse 6 and verse 15. Now, I'm just going to read the part that I want to make the point on here. It says that Israel is a land flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all lands. Then down to verse 15, it says, Bring them into a land which I had given to them, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all lands. So there's two verses in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Let a thing be established. So it's saying that Israel is the best land on the earth. Now, if you've ever been to Israel, you walk around <laughs> kicking rocks and you're seeing all of this dusty old uh, unproductive land and you'd be saying, this is the best land on the earth? <laughs> if this is the best the earth got, then we're in terrible shape. I mean, this is awful. It's not good at all. Okay, well, it's not what's on the surface that makes Israel the best land on the earth. It's what is underneath. Now, let's continue reading. He made him to ride upon the high places of the earth. The way we would say that is he's going to make Israel live in the best land on the earth that he might eat the increase of the fields. Okay. The way King James wrote is the things that they could understand. The way we would say that is he's, instead of he made him to eat the increase of the fields, is that Israel is going to live off the wealth of crude oil. But they don't understand that yet. See, now continue. And he made him to suck honey. Now the word there for honey, it's really not honey. The word there for honey is really stickiness. So when it says he made him to suck honey out of the rock and oil, and that's Strong's reference number 8081. It means either olive oil or grease. But again, do you suck olive oil out of a rock? You can go suck on all the rocks you want to, but you're not going to get one drop of olive oil. It's not talking about olive oil. It's talking about another kind of oil that comes out of rocks. Okay, what is, here's your question of the day. Uh, see if you're smarter than a fifth grader. Okay, <laughs> what is the only kind of oil that can be sucked out of a rock? The answer is crude oil. Out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock. We'll be right back after this message. If you would like to find out more about our vision to find oil in Israel, call 877-645-4772. That's 877-OIL-ISRAEL or 877-645-4772. That's 877-OIL-ISRAEL or 877-645-4772. There's no obligation. They'll send you out a free packet explaining our vision. Karen Anderson spent 10 hours a day for 10 years, 5 hours a day for 20 years, learning the secrets of Revelation from an astronomical point of view. None of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand, says the Bible. She says the book of Revelation is a call for the tribes of Israel to return by explaining the story of the Son of Man coming from one end of heaven to the other. By understanding Jesus' role in the heaven, it helps us fulfill our role on the earth. Many men have tried to read this message, but it is hidden until the appropriate time. The stars are a second witness to the Bible designed to be understood now. A letter from God to us to prove Jesus is the Messiah explaining this story called the Word of God and Jesus is the Word. Topics are the purpose of the earth, Bullinger's witness of the stars and Clarence Larkin, the wedding feast, the offerings of the temple and the man, the sickles of Revelation 14:14, 14, 14, the great seal and its secret purpose, the great pyramid and its role in early Christianity, five DVDs, almost 10 hours, valued at $150, all for a gift of just $50 or more. It's the Astronomical Book of Revelation. Call 785-266-1112. Five DVDs, 10 hours, Astronomical Book of Revelation. Gift of $50 or more, 785-266-1112.
And now, back to the program. Oil out of the flinty rock. Now, the interesting thing is some of the very best rock that they get oil out of is flint rock. That's right. Now, let's back up. Because when the Bible says milk and honey, it's not totally wrong the way it's saying it. It's just that we have a better understanding. Now, here's the way we would say this verse today. Instead of he made him to ride upon the high places of the earth, we would say, and he'll give Israel the best land on earth. And instead of that he might eat the increase of the fields, we would say, so that he can live off of the wealth down in the earth. And he made him to suck honey out of the rock. And he'll make him to get crude oil out of the rock. And instead of oil out of the flinty rock, we would say crude oil out of the flinty rock. So we would say, and he'll make Israel live on the best land of the earth to live off of the wealth down in the earth. And he'll make Israel to suck crude oil out of the rock and oil out of flinty rock. Now let's continue next verse. This is talking about more the physical blessings, so I'll just read through it real quick. Butter out of kine, milk out of sheep, fat out of lambs, lambs of the breed of Bashan, and goats with the fat of kidneys of wheat, and thou didst drink the pure blood of the grape. However, the next verse is talking about crude oil again, so we're going to talk about it more in depth. Verse 15. But Jeshurun waxed fat. Now, you got to look up that word Jeshurun to understand that that is another name for Israel. So the way we would say it today is, but Israel became fat. <laughs> well, you mean fat. I mean, is that like a big waste? No, it's saying became crude oil oriented or crude oil supported and kicked. And that word kicked means became strong, as in someone doubling up their fist and making a muscle. Okay, thou art waxen fat. And again, this is not talking about uh, fat like on an animal, but it's talking about crude oil. Thou have become crude oil the way we would say it, thou art grown thick, in other words, wealthy and strong, thou art covered with fatness, they're covered with, I believe we would say, crude oil wells drilling all over, then he forsook God which made him and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. The way we would say this is, and the reason they didn't get this sooner is because they lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. They lightly esteemed Jesus, the rock of that God sent as salvation. In other words, just like the other verse in Psalm 81, 16, if Israel had accepted Jesus sooner, they would have got the crude oil sooner. Because we accepted the Holy Spirit, we got the crude oil. Now we've begun to reject the Holy Spirit and reject God, and so consequently our finances are going away. All right, now let's jump to Genesis 14, 10. And the veil of Sedim was full of slime pits. And the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there. All right, the way we would say it today. And the valley of Sodom and Gomorrah had a bunch of slime pits where oil was oozing out and had dried and become like tar. So if you've ever been on a road that where they sprayed down tar or asphalt and you walk across that right after they sprayed it down, <laughs> uh, you might not make it across there because it's very sticky. That's the reason they drop rocks on top of it. It holds the rocks in place and that's how they make the road, okay? Slime pits. Well, the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah were fleeing from the people attacking them and they tried to get across the stick area, but it was like fly on flypaper, okay? They just stuck right to it. So that was the first reference that there is any kind of crude oil in Israel. Now, I have to tell you a story. In 1999, Hayseed Stevens took me over to Israel, showed me the actual well where he and two of the partners in 1985 had actually drilled looking for oil. And, of course, they, he said they were coming in to rock and then to salt, rock, salt, rock, salt, in various layers. And one time they went from rock into salt and they didn't change the mud fast enough, and the bit twisted into a knot, and he said they had to abandon the well. You see, it wasn't time yet, okay? However, when he was there, he showed me this valley, and I'm not going to tell you where it is, other than say it's at the southwest end of the Dead Sea. And down this valley, and I've taken now two different groups of people that have been on our tours to Israel with us down there, and the side of this ravine where this water has just washed down it there, it's just like a wall, 
there's oil oozing out of this wall every place. And you can walk up into, of course, anything that can evaporate, propane, butane, gasoline, things like that, those all evaporate. And so what you get are these tar hangs. It's about two inches to four inches long, this tar that is just hanging off the rocks, and it's kind of like picking grapes or picking apples. You can just walk up and just snap off a piece of this oil, and it's tar, and what we did is we had a little container for everybody, and they would put that tar in the container, and then they could take that container home with them. So many of them were actually able to take And we believe that this was, if not exactly, very close to the slime pits where the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there. Now, the obvious point is, if they had oil at the southwest end of the Dead Sea and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell in it, and we can still find the drips of oil coming out of the side of the ravine today. If it was there in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, and we find drips there today, obviously there's got to be oil below there too. Let me take you another example. Why we know that oil is in Israel. Exodus 2.3. It says, And when she could no longer hide Moses, she took for him an ark of bulrushes, and daubed it with slime and with pitch, and put the child therein, and she laid it in the flags by the river's bank. Well now, question. If you were to take an ark of bulrushes, I assume that that is something that has sticks, kind of a little boat made of sticks, and if you were to daub it inside and out with olive oil, put your baby in it, drop it into the river, what would happen? <laughs> uh, it's going <laughs> to, your baby's going to be in a lot of trouble, because the olive oil would not hold the water out. The word there for the slime and with pitch is the same word. In other words, it's this crude oil that's oozing out of the ground. And they had it there then, and it's there now. Now, in those days, that was down in Egypt. And of course, Egypt in that area has found oil. Matter of fact, there's a lot of oil in Egypt and in Libya. So in this case, it was without question not talking about olive oil, but instead is talking about crude oil. Now let's go into Deuteronomy 33, and I've done the same thing. These are my opinion. This is not scripture. Let me say it again. Not scripture. These are Stan's guesses on what this really means, starting Deuteronomy 33, 13. God will place Joseph upon the best land on the earth and cause him to eat by a sticky, greasy product sucked from flint rock. A valuable product used for income will shoot forth like a ray of light gushing from the earth. It will be a valuable produce expelled forth in one month. And these great blessings will come from the land, creating extreme wealth once concealed in the hills. A valuable product from the earth will cause wealth and double delight and will permanently bless Joseph. Now let's skip on down to verse 17. Because he is the firstborn, his magnificence will be as strong as a bull with two horns. He will attack and defeat his military, united as one at the end of time, near the return of Jesus at the end of the earth. Abundance upon abundance, the double portion will be given to Ephraim and Manasseh. Deuteronomy 33:18. And of Zebulun he said, Rejoice, Zebulun, in thy going out, and Issachar in thy tents. Now again, this is my Johnsonized version here. Now the scripture says, They shall call the people unto the mountain. And I believe that this is referring to, in the middle of the tribulation, when the Antichrist sits on the Ark of the Covenant, and the people see that abomination of spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, okay, then that's when Jesus says, run to the hills, don't come down off the housetop and pack or anything like that, head to the hills. And I believe that where most of the people that have the testimony of Jesus and keep the covenants of God will be going to Mount Sinai. And on the way down there, the devil opens up his mouth and pours water out of his mouth. The earth opens up and swallows the water and helps the woman, the woman being the remnant church. And they go down to Mount Sinai, and they have another experience there with God. 
Deuteronomy 33, 19, it says, and they shall call the people unto the mountain. I think it's referring to calling the people back to Mount Sinai, where they're supernaturally protected for 1260 days, which is three and a half years, the last three and a half years of the tribulation. That's the time of Jacob's trouble for those that stay behind in Jerusalem. So when it says they shall call the people unto the mountain, it's referring to the last days. It's a repeat of what happened in the earlier days. There they shall offer sacrifices of righteousness. Now notice it didn't say sacrifice of animals. Sacrifices of righteousness. In other words, the people clean up their lives. For they shall suck of the abundance of the seas and treasures hid in the sand. I think that's referring to crude oil. Now I would say it this way. I will call my people to the mountain. There they shall offer righteousness. And I will give them prosperity and resources from the sea concealed and hid in the sand. Verse 25. Your shoes will be iron and will bless you all of your days. Now, again, these are the Johnsonized version here, okay? The eternal Elohim, your refuge, will give you strength concealed in the deep and strengthen your arm to drive at your adversaries from your face and will say, destroy them. Israel will live in a place of refuge and divide the fountain of Jacob, gathering the earth's increase like grape juice squirted out. The sky shall drop double blessings. Now, in terms of that grape juice, I mean, if you're someone 3,500 years ago, how can you begin to explain to someone that oil is going to be under pressure, and when you drill down 5, 10, 20, 40,000 feet, when you hit that oil under pressure, it'll come squirting out of the ground. One place says, like the fair breast of a maiden, this particular uh, example says, like grape juice squirted out. In other words, like squeezing a grape, you see. So I think that's, again, not talking about olive oil. That's talking about crude oil. Well, the purpose of today's broadcast was to answer the question, is there oil in Israel? So I think that we have not done an exhaustive search into it today, but I do think that we've certainly answered the question, yes, absolutely, there is oil in Israel. And if you'd like to have the three DVDs, Prophecies of Oil in Israel, More Prophecies of Oil in Israel, and Asher's Hidden Prophecy of Oil in Israel, call the Prophecy Club, 785-266-1112. And if you'd like to have papers that will tell you about our vision to go and to attempt to find the oil in Israel, then you would call 877-OIL-ISRAEL. That's 877-645-4772. The Prophetic Oil Company cannot send out DVDs and the Prophecy Club cannot answer questions about oil companies. So you got to call the right place, okay? Prophecy Club, 785-266-1112. And Prophetic Oil is 877-OIL-ISRAEL or 877-645-4772. Thank you for listening, and thank you for your prayers and your gifts of support. God bless. Now from the Prophecy Club, some exciting opportunities for you. If you would like to find out more about our vision to find oil in Israel, call 877-645-4772. That's 877-OIL-ISRAEL or 877-645-4772. That's 877-OIL-ISRAEL or 877-645-4772. There's no obligation. They'll send you out a free packet explaining our vision. The Prophecy Club Summer Newsletter is now available for download at prophecyclub.com or you can call 785-266-1112 and we'll mail it to you free for our free newsletter. Nothing I'm saying in this program should be deemed an offering or a solicitation for you to buy a security. Any such thing can only be done through a proper legal prospectus, such as a private placement document approved by the company. My statements are my personal views and opinions, and they are not a legal representation or a promise. I cannot promise I know the exact location of oil in Israel, nor that I will ever drill for or find oil in Israel. This interview is for entertainment purposes only. Any legal relationship, which would include a business relationship or an investment, will only be done through proper legal documents. Thank you for understanding. Stan Johnson.